And um, one here for John Stevens, if I may. Uh, John, from a biblical perspective, what right, if any, does the government have to tell us how we can or, or can't worship? And there's a real question here because actually there's what the legal power the state has under the current law and what it ought to do biblically. So we at least have to recognise that the state has the power to coerce the closure of places of worship and to enforce that through the police and through the authorities. So in terms of blunt power, the state is able to do that. The question is whether if the state chose to order closure or to take that action, how Christians should respond to that. Um, I think the key thing for us all here is to think through the biblical principles on that. And it seems to me we're trying to hold together two principles at the same time. One is that the Bible clearly teaches that we should respect and obey authorities that have been placed over us. The other side is that we should obey Christ rather than men if there's a, a clash between what the state requires and what God requires. Um, now, actually applying that in practice, it seems to me, is actually a, a, a much more difficult question. And we need to recognise that it will be an issue of individual conscience for Christians, churches and leaders who may reach different judgments, because frankly, it's not a black and white um, obvious situation. I don't think it's the same as the command to the Hebrew midwives of kill the babies, nor is it quite the same as the command to the apostles never to preach in the name of Jesus. So one of the problems is we're actually having to discern what the Bible can commands us to do and then think about how that works out to the state. So I think there's a, a kind of inevitable issue of conscience and there'll be an inevitable um, degree of difference of opinion amongst Christians. It seems to me what's crucial is that the Bible doesn't allow us to disobey simply because we dislike a law and find it inconvenient. The Bible doesn't allow us to disobey simply because we distrust the government. So distrust is not a reason for disobedience. Um, uh, it, it seems to me that we, we, we're not entitled to disobey simply because we disagree with a policy choice and a law that's been made to implement it. And at the moment, there's lots of different opinions about what should be done about COVID. And um, uh, it's hard to know what, which of those opinions is right. But I'm not sure that we have the right to disobey just because we disagree with a policy the circumstance in which we have the right to disobey and ought to disobey is when we believe we have a higher duty to obey Christ uh, and obeying Christ would be prevented by um, obedience to the legislation and when we're prepared to do that I think we've got to openly and honestly recognize that we ought to then accept the due penalty for our disobedience we disobey with our eyes open of knowing that there will be consequences that follow uh, from that so I think the difficult question that we've all got to work through is in a time of a health emergency, which is how this is described, uh, to what extent do we have a duty to gather as Christians physically? That's the real question that we have to wrestle through biblically and in, in conscience. And I think that means we need to do a number of things. We need to bear in mind what it is we're actually prevented from doing. We're not prevented from believing. We're not prevented from preaching. We're not prevented from gathering online. There are some things we can't do if we gather physically, but there's a, a margin between what we can do and what we can't do. You've got to work through, does Christ demand that we disobey in order to um, uh, uh, meet physically in that, in that way? Um, I think we also need to think through what's the principle we're standing for. So um, is the principle we're standing for that the state could never order churches to close? Um, and I think the problem there is I'm not seeing anybody really arguing that. Um, uh, the argument is often bound up with not believing it's a real health emergency and not believing the measures are necessary. But even at their most extreme, I'm not really hearing Christians and church leaders saying God commands that we gather and no matter how bad it was, no matter how big the risk, we ought to be allowed to gather. So really what we're negotiating is the, that kind of what is the principle? Is it that the, the measures that are being asked of us are disproportionate to the risk? So we've got to be careful that we articulate it in, I think, the right way. Um, I think it's important to think through our churches being discriminated against in terms of the wider picture of society. So if this is all about restraining the virus, are we being wrongly treated compared to others? I think in how we approach this, as I said, it's a matter of conscience. We've got to be very careful not to bind the consciences of others and say that others have to agree with us and take the action that we want to take or that even support it. So, um, for example, if we're saying there's a duty to gather, what are we saying to the vulnerable people in our churches? What, what are we saying to the people who are nervous and risk averse and don't want to come out? Are they disobeying Christ 
because they're making that judgment. Pastoral leadership in that context has got to take account of the diversity of different opinions amongst God's people before we start commanding them what they've got to do. Um, uh, I think many of our congregations are far more risk averse than our leaders um, and we need to bear that in mind. Um, and I think it's inevitable that denominations and networks can't support disobedience when it's not clear cut, um, when it isn't the case that it's obvious that we ought to disobey and everybody broadly agrees with that. So there's a difference between individual choices and what denominations and groupings are going to say. I also think we need to bear in mind public opinion. What does the public think of what we're doing? Do they think we're making a right judgment in insisting on that right to gather where maybe um, uh, they are not gathering? Um, I think it's important for us to bear in mind that we have other options before disobedience. We've got the right to enforce our legal rights. So under the Human Rights Act, uh, we have freedom of worship. That can be set aside on grounds of public health, but that is subject to judicial review. If we really believe the regulations are not proportionate and not necessary, then we can challenge them in that legal form. All the cases so far would suggest that we wouldn't win. Um, uh, but if, for example, the death rates, hospital rates in the future are very low, it would be much more difficult for government to argue that the rules are pr proportionate. And of course, we can protest and lobby um, um, government, uh, whether writing to our sort of government MPs, MSPs, letters to newspapers, making use of, of lobby lobbying groups. In my personal uh, opinion, the kind of arguments that are unlikely to work with government and indeed the public are the um, a kind of argument that churches are a special case compared to other sections of society. I think once government starts taking action to lock down the whole of society in people's gyms, cinemas, pubs, hospitality venues, I don't think it's a winning argument in the public sphere to say churches are exceptional. The statistics are that only 3 million people attend church in the UK, that's about 4.6% of the population. 53% of people say they prefer to spend their leisure time in pubs. 40% visit a pub um, once a fortnight. There are 176 million cinema visits a year. We need to have some perspective that in a secular society, church is a very minority activity compared to the restrictions the rest of society is having to bear. And I think we just need to bear that in mind as we make arguments trying to persuade a secular world that church is exceptional when quite clearly that's not what society um, believes. So that's not an easy answer to the question, but I think that's the framework by which we have to go about um, uh, sort of asking it. And in the end, it's a matter for conscience, bearing in mind all of those principles before God. And I don't think there's any easy, simplistic answer at this point. <laughs>